you guys. Welcome back to Pretty Girl Practice. Today I'll be interviewing Dr. Christiana Anderson, who is a pediatrician. She's in her third year of residency, which is actually her last year of residency before she completes her training. I met Dr. Anderson this summer during my internship, and she was just so nice and so helpful, which can be kind of rare to find in medicine. So I'm just really appreciative that she took some time out of her busy schedule to help me make this video for you guys. So please stay tuned, and I hope you enjoy. Today we have Dr. Anderson, and she is a pediatrician. So, first of all, um, we'll get started with a little introduction about you. Okay. So, where's your hometown? So, I grew up in uh, a suburb of San Diego, California, called Oceanside. It's very similar to like a Galveston or a Lake City. It's a small coastal city that's about 30 minutes outside of uh, the city of San Diego. And it's a lot of coastal fields, a lot like Galveston. And um, what was your undergrad major and what university did you go to? So I went to Westmont College, which is in uh, Santa Barbara, California. It's a couple hours north of LA. Um, and I majored in both chemistry and biology. Oh, wow. I had a hard time so I did, I did both. That's so awesome. It helped because being pre-med at that time, you take chemistry and biology. So. What med school did you go to? I went to Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine in New York City. Okay, awesome. All right, so we'll get started. So take me back a decade. Uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? So if, if, I, if I take myself back a decade, I actually just graduated college because I took a little bit of time off before I went to med school. So I go back to high school. Um, but if you think about a year, you know, what would have been 10 years for most for most people in medical school. I um, I thought back then that I was going to be a chef, and I had dreams of being an Olympic bobsledder. Uh, I was a U.S. recruitment athlete for the national bobsled team, which is not as exciting as it sounds. Just because <laughs> that I lifted weights and ran ran fast, I never actually got to make it into into try bobsled or anything like that. But um, so yeah, I thought I was going to be a chef, but I didn't I didn't like the job security of going to culinary arts school, so I decided to get a regular degree and um, get a job as a chef, kind of. Um, after school and you know, during the summers, and um, really my journey through medicine started my senior year of high school. Um, I was the bystander of a, of a, a bicyclist who ran into a car, um, and I didn't know it at that moment, but um, I knew it probably about six months to a year later when I was in school and studying science, which is something I liked and sort of was my, my study career plan and my culinary arts was sort of going to be my real goal. Um, that. You know, I always sort of liked medicine, but I just never thought the, the, the hard parts of medicine, the death and tragedy type things, was really for me. And what I realized from that day, kind of moving forward, which I kind of discovered later on, was that in the moments that are hard, you kind of go to work. And when you're in a situation that you have an opportunity to help someone, you, yes, they're hard moments, but you go to work. So um, uh, that's sort of when I started, started my journey to be in. So, how did you decide on your undergrad college, and how did you decide on a major? So, I decided on my undergrad college, it was sort of a, a mixture of family pressure um, and liking the place it was at. So, um, I come from a, my mom is a wonderful Italian Hispanic lady who I love <laughs> very much, but wanted me somewhat close to home. Um, and so, I sort of given a mileage radius that I was allowed to apply to. Um, and you know, at the time when I was going to school, you know, the economy was having a hard time. A lot of the state schools, you know, it was very difficult to get your classes and get them on time and graduate in four years. And I had fairly good GPA in, in high school, but um, I was really the first person in my family to kind of go straight through college from without going to junior college or something first. Um, so this idea of applying straight out of high school and looking for scholarships was sort of new and charted territory for me and my family. But um, I was lucky enough that I was able to get GPA scholarships from just, just having good grades. Um, and then I ended up long story short with a theater arts scholarship as well. Um, and so I was able to make private college education cheap enough that it was comparable to the state school, um, which they had a guaranteed for your graduation. Um, so I ended up picking my college largely because it it was it would allow me to graduate in four years. It was close enough to home, but it was the furthest one away from home that I would really go to. Um, and it was in a place I really liked. It was in a place that was scenic and kind of in the middle of kind of coastal, coastal California, but also also with mountains nearby, and just very scenic. A place I liked very much. So, mm -hmm. um, 
I knew when I went into college I would probably end up in engineering, math, or science because I liked those things and those were my strong suit. I am very terrible at writing. <laughs> really, really terrible at writing. Um, I literally would fail a poetry class um, <laughs> if I had to. And so I knew I would end up something in there. Um, I took kind of the basic classes my freshman year and year out. I thought I would probably do physics or math or biology or something like that. And I never thought I'd major in chemistry because I hated it in high school. I thought it was terrible. And I realized sitting in my like my freshman chemistry class that I um, that I had to take that I just didn't understand it when I took it in high school. And as I understood it the second time around going through it in college, it really made a lot of sense. And I realized that it um, it sort of was very much the mindset of the way I like. I like the puzzles and I like the way things interact and fit together and molecules are exactly that. So um, I so I kind of really started to fall in love with chemistry. Um, and I still very much enjoyed biology. It's where I first got my start in science way back in like seventh grade. Um, you know, doing experiments and kind of figuring out the way the world works. Um, so I sort of pursued both things and being pre-med gave me the, the overlap and the ability both. Um, I still studied some, some physics and math in college, but you know, when I got to theoretical geometry, when the numbers went away, I sort of was like, I think I'm done here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would think the same. So, but I, you know, my parents have always been very, very encouraging of trying things and just trying a bunch of different things. And so, in college, I studied a bunch of different things. Um, you know, outside of my majors, you know, I did research in a couple of different things. I did jobs in a couple of different departments. Uh, I took like every PE class known to man. I learned how to fence and ballroom dance and all of these things. And, um, I would encourage college students to do the same thing. That you don't always even know if you like or dislike something. Mm -hmm. I'd agree with that as well. I feel like we limit ourselves really quickly. I know I do not like postmodern performance theory. That was not that was not an ideal class to have taken. <laughs> That yeah, my life could have been better without that. So you win some, you lose some. I suppose. Yeah. What was the hardest part of your undergraduate studies, and how did you get through it? So I think the hardest part for me came sort of at the end of my second year in college. So um, I ended up going through college in three years. Um, so my family took a pretty hard hit when the economy started to slide in kind of the early mid two thousands, and it became pretty clear to me. Um, so, it's, uh, sort of two things happened in pretty quick succession. By the end of my sophomore year, I would sort of arranged my schedule such that I could take up an abroad semester. Um, so I had made it so that most of my hard classes, I really only really had about three semesters worth of classes left so that I could do this abroad semester. And, um, you know, my parents were having a really hard time and it just became really obvious that I just wasn't going to be able to do that. And um, I started looking at my classes again and I realized that if I took if I took five classes my um, the second semester of my sophomore year and I took Spanish and English composition over the summer in between my second and my third year of college I could graduate in three years um, so that's what I did um, so but that meant that I had to take five lab science classes all in the same semester um, hindsight being 2020 I graduating in three years was the right choice for me at the time. Um, I would not willingly recommend someone down that path because it, it takes what should be four years and squeezes it down to three. So not only did I have a very difficult semester I had to get through, but it also sort of socially sort of put you in between two classes. So that was, which, which was great and not great, because so, you're sort of in an awkward spot. Um, I think that, how did I get through it in the short term? Not sleeping. Uh, is mm -hmm. the real answer. Um, but being very organized, um, being very diligent about my time, preparing to do things in advance, and just sometimes you're busy enough that you just don't have time to stress about it. You just have to get work done. Um, and I think that's a pretty important thing for a lot of people, that you know, staying organized and understanding, prioritizing what needs to be done what time is really how I got through it. Uh, probably was not the healthiest of semesters. I probably did not sleep as much as I should have. and. Um, probably drank more caffeine than I should have, but I guess when you're young, it's part of the experience of going through it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it was the right thing for me at the time, and it was the right thing for my family. It allowed me to be able to give back to my family in a nice way. Um, because I graduated early, I spent some time, I took some time off to kind of help take care of them at home. 
Um, so it was a right choice, but it was a hard choice. And what did you do between undergrad and med school? So I did I did four years of engineering research. Oh, wow. So the first so my first uh, my first job when I graduated was actually so I took an engineering internship, um, a dad uh, a job that my dad helped me get um, through a company he knew that just knew that they had a good internship program and um, so I took the summer internship and it was at a company that makes pools and spas and bathtubs and kayaks and things like that. So not exactly a biology chemistry field, but they have a good internship program and um, yeah, I thought it would be sort of a fun thing to do for the summer while I applied for jobs in biotech or research. And um, you know, it was it was really interesting. I got to be part of kind of a smaller engineering program where it was very all hands on deck, where you if you had the ability to kind of think analytically and come up with good experiments and test things um, and just be a problem solver, it didn't really matter what your background was. You know, even if being a chemistry or biology, all of these things are still experiments and you still can approach things in a very logical, reasonable way way and yes it was a different field of science but they're still figuring out new problems so I got into it and truthfully I just had a lot of fun um, and I, I found that I was able to apply my skill set to their industry um, I was given a lot of responsibility and ended up being somewhat successful at it so they offered me a job so I stayed um, I stayed for about two years um, and I loved my job but um, after about two years they just were having trouble as a company um, and I ended up getting laid off which was a hard, a really hard thing to go through, um, you know, getting like forcibly removed from a job that you like. But in all honesty, it was a very good, it was a good bad thing that happened because um, it, it was a job I probably would have had a hard, I would have been able to walk away from it for medicine. You know, um, it was kind of one of those if you take time off from going to school, you have a plan of how long it's going to take you to take off. And um, it was one of those like one became two became three sort of scenarios. And when I lost my job with Dimension One. Um, you know, I was applying. I was going to apply to medical school that summer, and you know, I but I needed a job to pay for applications and stuff. So I started looking at new jobs, and I got a job offer from this company called Illumina. They make machine. They make genetic sequencers and array machines, and but they wanted a two-year commitment. They wanted me to stay for two years. And what I didn't know is this little job offer would turn into one of the best experiences. Life. Awesome. Met one of my best friends there. Um, I got to do just very exciting, cutting edge research. Um, I got to do very interesting things that paid well to do it. I got to travel for work. I got to do really what is an ideal pre medicine job. I could pick what I would have done, you know, outside of it. If I wasn't going to do this, you know, one of the things I would have done would have been something like that. Um, and it was an ideal non medicine job, but it still wasn't enough for me. So it was a very, very, very good thing for me to do before going to medical school because. The hard part about going straight through is that you don't get a break. Mm -hmm. You don't get a break, and it's hard to not have a break. Um, but it's nice that I had a break that really showed me in those moments that are hard, first and second year, when I'm up 24 hour call. Like I remember what it's like to have a very good job outside of this, and I remember why it's so, what it's such a blessing to do what we do. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, I'm very glad I had that experience. The downside is I'm like, you know, I spent four years delayed, right? So I'm a little older, which means that I'm trying to figure out how to have kids and have life and do all this stuff, four years delayed is a little bit harder. So how and when did you decide on a medical school? So on a medical school, um, so I decided really sort of probably about two years, two to three years after I graduated undergrad. So I ended up going to osteopathic medical school, which when I graduated college, I had like no idea what on earth that meant. Um, I thought that osteopaths were, you know, I thought it was just like um, just primary care. And they were like just internal medicine doctors. Um, and then one of the jobs I had when I first graduated from medical school, in addition to my research job, is I used to be an ER scribe at night. And I worked with these DOs in the ER, and I was like, wait a second, I thought you guys were just like primary care. And I came to find that they were kind of, um, they got to like, do anything. Um, and one of my friends got into DO school about a year later and she was going through the process and kind of telling me a little bit about what it was like and I sort of really figured out that DO school was sort of the right path for me. You know, in addition to just regular medicine, we get taught manipulative medicine too, which means I can adjust muscles and crack backs and all this stuff. Um, and I played a lot of sports growing up and it has a very kind of sports medicine sort of feel, 
um, and I like that additional skill set. So watching some of my friends go through GEO school, I'm like, you know, I think this is the right path for me. Um, and one of my friends that I met at my job um, at Illumina was, her, his wife was a TO, and she taught me a lot about it, and so she went to the California Toro campus, so, so I thought I was going to apply to the DO school in Cal- Colorado where my friends went to, and the ones in California, and I, you know, applied to a couple others, and I thought, you know, that'll probably be enough. These are really the schools I want to go to. I'm old enough where it's like, I don't get in this year, I'll apply for next year. Um, and so I sent in my application to the California school, and AMCAS has this little pop-up that goes, whoop, would you like to apply to all four Toro campuses for an initial $20? And I was like... Yes, $100 application. Yes, that seems like a really good life choice. Uh-huh. <laughs> and um, New York emailed me back like right away. And here's this little DO school in New York City who's asking me to come interview. And I thought, you know, this is sort of an interesting, different sort of opportunity. Something new and different. And, um, you know, so I went out and it seemed like a fun experience to kind of go to New York. And um, I like to travel and I think I was really ready for something new and different. And, um, you know, I couldn't have guessed that just like a random pop up would change my life and change where I moved. And I think it was always sort of the plan for me to go there. Um, you know, so it was sort of a happy accident that I ended up in New York. But I think the decision to go to DO school was sort of a long one coming for me. Um, I think that when you apply to medical schools, you have to be a little realistic about college. You know, based off of your scores and where you live and what the regional preference is, you have to kind of apply a little strategically. But I think it's also okay to be a little, I think it's a little, it's okay to be a little open. Um, to maybe try a new thing for a new period of time. Medical school is a very defined period of time. And, you know, it's kind of a fun thing to kind of go and try something new and different. But ultimately where you tend to be happy to, happiest is a place you enjoy living. So you have to sort of figure out what's most important to you. I think, um, I think at the end of the day, what helps you best with your residencies is the kind of person you are in the letters you're going to have. I think medical school education for most places across the country is pretty similar. Um, and affordability is a very important thing. You know, medical school that's very affordable. Go there. I would never go to this one. <laughs> I will admit that New York City Medical School was a very fun life choice, financially. <laughs> Probably would have been better for me to go to Colorado. <laughs> What did you do to be a good medical school applicant? Do you feel that your work experience benefited you? Yeah, I mean, I think it was very key. I think having practical life experience um, was a huge thing. I think one of the biggest things that aided my application, in all honesty, was the fact that I was a medical scribe, in large part because I firsthand saw medicine. You could say, I know what it looks like, and I still want to do it. Um, I think that's a really important thing for people that are applying. You know, we're all we all like science, we all have relatively good grades, we all have relatively good scores. Um, yes, some scores will be better than others, but at the end of the day, I think the person you are and your desire to do this thing are the biggest things that matter. Um, and I think un- seeing it firsthand, understanding the challenges and sacrifices of being in medicine and saying, yes, I still want to do it, and I still know it's right for me, it's probably the biggest thing. So I don't, you don't have to be medical scribe, you don't have to work in the health Field, but I think you do. I think it's really helpful to have something that is first-hand experience, volunteer and chat with something where you're in there in a medical setting, seeing it firsthand, and you can say, "Yes, I still want to do this." How did you decide on pediatrics? So I think it all goes back to Doc McStuffins, and all honesty, <laughs> she's really so, cute. Yeah, so I had no idea who this Doc McStuffins character was. So I did my pediatric rotation at midpoint of my third year of medical school. Um, and I thought going into third year, I would probably like ER because I wrote to, you know, I was an ER scribe. I thought maybe I'd like surgery because I, you know, I'd like to do things with my hands or maybe I'd like OB-GYN because I like the idea of delivering babies. And, you know, sort of open-minded, you know. I just wanted to kind of see what was out there and see what I'd like. And I thought, you know, I do like kids. I'm probably like a PD subspecialty, but general pediatrics, that will probably bore me. I probably won't like it. Um, and I was, it was like the second or third day of my pediatric clerkship, and they send me off to a room by myself to do my very first exam on like a little kid. They let me do some teenagers and you know bigger kids that could talk to me. And so I'm going in to see like a three or four year old, and 
I open the door, and this little kid just runs up to me, just awestruck, like mouth <laughs> open, and he just goes, "Are you the real life dog mixed muffins?" Aww. And I'm like looking down at the small child, like, "Well, you're not crying." Yeah, well, I can be. Like, I should, yeah, most definitely. I'm like really happy. The toddler's happy to see me, so I'm like, in this moment, I'm like, I could be anybody you want me to be, friend. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I do the interview, and it goes really good. And I come out of the door, and all my attendings are kind of like sitting up along the counter writing their notes. And I kind of look at them, and I go, I shut the door, I look at them, and I go, who's Dak makes ovens? And, you know, all of these people just start laughing at me. I'm like napping mm-hmm. because I don't have children. I'm like, who is this person? Um, and I think looking back, that was really the moment that it was just such a joyful moment. It was such a happy experience taking care of that kid. And that ultimately is what people pediatrics it's, it's just a lot of fun um taking care of a child every day is for a special experience because it's a very untainted life you know it's a it's a kid that you know it's it's very um it's not like they're doing things to ruin their health um and you're just doing something very al- altruistic to help somebody um and i enjoy that very much and it's fun it's fun every day um i think when you're looking at picking your subspecialty everybody's got different still skill sets and strengths and interests and um, I see medical students every day all try to compete on the same playing field. And it's just not going to happen with your subspecialty. What you like or what I like may not be the same thing, and that is okay because your skill set is going to is going to allow you to be able to take care of unique care for your patients. And so that's going to sometimes fit in a different subspecialty or in a different way in that subspecialty or a different subspecialty, um, you know, inpatient or outpatient or rural or urban, you know. Um, these things all take on very different feels. I think that every medical student is ultimately kind of geared to be a little bit stronger in one area or the other. Um, I encourage everybody to go into third year very open-minded because um, you may you may be surprised what you like. Okay, so how did you decide on your residency program and how's your experience been so far? I think I decided on my residency program largely because Looking back at the moment, I think it's because it felt like home. I'm from a small coastal city that's a suburb of a big count, bigger county, and I think I loved my time in New York City. I spent to a lot of my third and fourth year kind of even in the like more mountain communities and more um, uh, rural areas of New York. And so I've got to, I've gotten to live in New York City and I've gotten to live up in the mountains and I, you know, living in snow and all that was a fun experience. But I think I missed an ocean. And I think that when I came over the causeway for the first time, I think it just reminded me of home. And I think it had a feeling of home. And I think I had had the opportunity of rotating kind of in the Gulf um, as a fourth year. And what I love about the South is that there's there's enough of a population without quite as quite the same density of physicians as California or Chicago or New York. And so there's a very palpable need for physicians here and feeling very functional, feeling very needed is something I really feel like I need personally. So I feel very useful here. I feel like my, um, I feel like my patients, you know, you can get 20 minutes outside of Galveston and there's, there's a lot of people that need good doctors. Um, so it's, here's this little coastal town that feels a lot like home and they have a palpable need for people like me. Um, and people in Texas are just so kind. Um, it's affordable to live here. Um, people are very sweet, and there's a lot of finesse of medicine. You know, we learn the science, but a lot of what we do in practic- practicality is learning how to talk to people and learning how to help people through difficult things. A lot of that is how you're going to emulate the people you learn from. And the idea of learning those sorts of things from people who are very sweet and very kind seems like a kind of okay idea to me. And you're going to spend a lot of time with your colleagues. So working with people that are very sweet and very kind seemed like the kind of doctor I wanted to be, the kind of people I wanted to be around, and ultimately like sort of the kind of people I would like to raise my children around someday. Mm-hmm. So the South sort of meant all of those, okay. all of those things for me. I'd agree, but I'm from Texas, so it might be yeah. biased. Yeah. So that's I think what sort of draws here, and then you know Galveston was just the coast. I never thought I'd match at UTMB because I thought it blew my interview. Mm. Um, Long story short, I got asked kind of a, a, a prescripted question in my interview, and I had a very genuine but very passionate response to the answer. And uh, I, looking back at that moment, I remember I remember having that interview, and I remember walking out of the room at the end of the interview, thinking, "Oh no, 
<laughs> what did you just do? Like, you know, when you interview, you know, there's a certain decorum to it. And I sort of, I sort of just was me, unfiltered in that moment. And um, I thought, there's no way that I can make. So apparently, I told my husband the following three things when I interviewed at UTMB. I went to the most amazing chocolate place today because I went to La King's after my interview. <laughs> I really liked it. I don't think there's any chance they're going to rank me. Aww. So we really wanted to be in Texas. We ranked we ranked um, UTB and we just didn't expect them to rank us back. Mm -hmm. So when we got it, it was like happy surprise. It was like, oh, oh. Uh -huh. So we were happy to be here. That's awesome. What does your husband do? Well, I married a not doctor. Okay. Um, so he uh, he does. Um, uh, IT database programming, and that sounds very fancy, but what it means is when you apply to medical school or all of these things, and you, your little application goes into a big giant database, and on the end, he works and it spits out a whole bunch of information. Hmm. So every time you apply to school online or apply to get an apartment complex or all of these things, all the information you fill out in your form goes into a big database. Um, and Sean is good at manipulating that area of computers to make it spit out the information it needs. That's awesome. Um, How have you managed to balance school um, relationships and self-care since you started med school and residency? So you sort of have to prioritize. Sometimes there are going to be times where one or the other sort of takes priority. Um, but you have to prioritize what is important in your life um, and, um, and honor that in a practical way. So I'm married. I got married in medical school. Um, you know, if I had to list off the things that are important to me as a person in my life, you know, you know, my faith is going to be up there one. Probably my husband is next, and then you know, my career is probably right behind that. Um, there are plenty of times where my career practically takes precedent over my own personal wellness, my relationship with my husband. Um, but there has to be some give and take in that. Um, so you have to set apart time for that. One of the ways that that looks practically is, you know, when I was in medical school, you know, obviously when you're first and second year, you're studying all the time, right? And how do you try to fit in relationships and friends and these sorts of things to it is, you know, you need breaks. You need breaks or else mentally you're going to burn out and you will not be a better person for it. And that, that aspect remains true with the rest of your career. So I used to have a night. That was my husband's time. It didn't mean that I didn't study a little bit before we would go out and do something or a little bit afterwards, but he would have, you know, an, an evening or half a day or something that was his protected time. And then I knew and he, he knew that my time before that, my time after that was sort of mine to study a lot more, but then that was his protected time. Um, and I think it allowed me to be less stressed um, about spending time with him, and I think it allowed him to be less stressed about spending time with me. And that's something we do even now. We set apart time that I don't work and I just spend time with him. Um, I think he needs that and I think I need that. Does it mean that we do that every day? No. Do, does it mean that we get to spend the same amount of time that we would if I wasn't in medicine? No. But um, that's how we, that's one of the ways we make it work. But you still need that time, that sort of time for yourself. You need that sort of time with your friends because you have to be a whole individual as you're going through this and you have to find a way to go through it the way. Um, you know, I will say that probably the thing that takes the biggest hit in all of this for me personally is probably the amount that I exercise. Um, I'm the kind of person that used to exercise like two hours a day. I love it. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I used to like run four or five days a week and swim a lot and do all kinds of things. And I miss that. Like I miss playing sports all the time. And I'm not as fit as I used to be, but uh, you know, I would not, I know that in the long term I will have, it's not that I don't do these things, I just do them less. Um, in the long term, I'll be able to do them more, but, you know, there are sacrifices, there's a balance to, I still have to study, and I have to make sure my clinical duties are done, and I need to spend time with my husband, and I need to Sometimes I need to, like, I don't know, like, just take a bath and watch a TV show, and just nothing. And that's okay. So, it's a balance. Like many things, my bit is a balance. Um, you know, you have to prioritize in the short term. Do you have an exam coming up? Yes, you're probably not going to go see that movie right now, but that's okay. Um, but it's okay to make a little breaks. Yeah, I agree. What does your ideal career look like? So, um, I have decided that I want to be a pediatric emergency medicine physician. Um, so it's a, it's a pediatrician who 
is fellowship trained in emergency medicine and works specifically in ERs just for children. Um, there are a lot of different ways to get to that particular type of job. Um, I've chosen the pathway of becoming a pediatrician that's fit fellowship trained. Um, if I could pick an ideal job, it would probably be at an academic center, which is where most pediatric children's hospitals are, where I could do kind of a variety of things. Um, as you can probably tell, I like a lot of different things. I had two majors in college. I've done about three or four different kinds of research. I played about a half dozen sports, and I considered about four different subspecialties before I decided on pediatrics. <laughs> I like a lot of things. So ER fits that bill kind of to begin with because you're sort of prepared to do a variety of things. Being pediatric trained and then pediatric fellow trained still allows me to do general pediatrics. I can do newborn medicine. Um, being in an academic center would allow me to do some research or teach. Um, maybe do some community sports medicine for a local football team or something. Um, and I sort of expect to do a little bit of involved. So I can pick an ideal job. I probably do maybe 60% of my time would be doing just pediatric ER, and then maybe the rest of the time would be split doing a little bit of academic teaching and a little bit of uh, maybe one day a week I'm just a general pediatrician. Maybe a couple weeks out of the year I work in the newborn nursery, you know. Um, practically, is it possible to do all these things simultaneously? <laughs> usually not, but usually it's more that you ebb and flow. So for a season of time, you sort of do two, maybe three of them, and then you sort of transition into a different area of your life where you're doing more than the other. Where do you see yourself in five years? Let's see, in five years, hopefully, graduated from fellowship and getting a real job. <laughs> um, uh, I anticipate that at that point, my husband and I will probably be parents, um, you know, at 31 and 32, respectively, you know. Um, that's a, that is on the near near horizon, when, when on earth we're going to have kids. Mm -hmm. We're over the 30 mark, so I suppose we have to start thinking about that. Um, <laughs> We probably will have four kids. Oh, uh, wow! I physically will probably not have four children. <laughs> um, we would very much like to adopt some kids. Okay, awesome. Um, the split in the middle is I would adopt all of my kids. Sean would like to have some. We'll probably do somewhere in between. <laughs> um, you know, but you know, until you cross that threshold, you don't really know how many kids you're going to have and where they're all going to come from. So um, I anticipate that by five years from now, we'll probably have at least one. Do you plan on staying in Texas, or do you guys want to move again? Depends on where I get a fellowship job. So okay. fellowships are even more selective than medical school residency. So there's in the great state of Texas, we have exactly four pediatric fellowships. We are lucky that Houston is one of the biggest cities in the country and even bigger for medical training. So we have two. <laughs> oh, awesome. So there are a lot of fellowship jobs here in Texas. If we can, if I could get a fellowship job here, we would like buy a house and put down limits. Um, and presumably, our fellowship move would potentially be a, a more permanent group for us. Would, if there will be a job for this there or not, you know, that's so hard to say, but you know, once we find out where I can get a job in the PD or not, because we'll have to stay full long. If it could be here, excellent. If we'd like to stay in Texas for a while. Um, you know, we picked Texas on purpose and I think that when you're looking at residency and you're looking at fellowships and things like that, you know, there's sort of two schools of thought. Some people are like, well, it's a good opportunity to go someplace brand new and totally different. Um, but I will say that each sequential move you make in your career tends to be a little bit more likely you're going to stay there. Um, and my husband and I are in faith in our life where that's very much true. I think that, you know, the more times you pick up a move of your life and your friends, you know, kind of you want to stay in your life. But that's us and our story and our journey. But, you know, I think being open to the possibilities is the more important part. And how many more years of residency do you have? This is my last one. Oh! Yes. So? I a little, I have not even lie, a little bit of senioritis. Oh. I have the theme song to Red just playing in the background a lot of years, <laughs> a lot of the year. Um, but it's residency is hard. Everybody tells you in medical school it's the hardest time in your career. You'll, you know, um, and you feel like you work really hard in medical school, you work really hard in third and fourth year, and you get to you get to residency and you go, oh, this is what they meant by that. Mm -hmm. It's both easier and harder than you expect. Um, the hardest thing about it is that there is a lot to learn in a finite period of time, and um, you have to do it as you're learning it. Um, so there's a lot of ways to put too much pressure on yourself, and really the truth of the matter is for residency, and this is very applicable even backwards from medical students, 
be a little smarter tomorrow than you were today. You're not going to learn it all one day. You're not going to learn it all overnight. But be a little smarter tomorrow. And every time you, you have a moment where you're like, oh, I really should know that, remember that ultimately someday how well you understand the pathophysiology of that drug or that test or that, that disease mechanism will translate to how you are able to make decisions for your your patients come up with a differential diagnosis that will find the right diagnosis for them, be able to explain it to their family. Um, these things have very practical implications. Sometimes it's just to pass a test. So one question we learn is just to pass a test. You're never going to see it or it's never really going to be that thing. In your life, but most of it is applicable. What sacrifices have you made for your career? Probably not being a parent yet, in all honesty. you know, um, I don't think there's ever a day I would have thought I would be 30 and not a parent. You know, I think when you think of where you'll be when you're in college, right? You think of where you'll be, you know, some people think they'll get married when they're 25, some people will say that they're 30, some people, you know, they never want to get married, or maybe it'll be much later. And I think for me, I didn't really anticipate that I'd get married young, but I sort of thought sometime when I was around 30 that I would probably be a parent. And pre residency, I thought, sure, yeah, well, definitely. Residency is not a terrible time. Now that I'm in it, it's like, well, oh, I'm a Leah. And people do it. People absolutely do it. And I don't know how. Um, you know, it hasn't been the right time for me and my husband. And, you know, that's a, a definite thing that we have pushed off in our marriage because it's just not the right time because of my career. Because I don't think it's, it hasn't been the right time for me to come forward and balance. Is there ever a right time? I think so. No. There's never a perfect time. Um, but that would probably, I would say that's a sacrifice for probably me. Um, obviously, we've we've made giant sacrifices to move away from our friends and family, um, and that's a hard thing. You know, when people have kids and birthday parties happen or life events happen back home, and you're working or on call or you have an exam, that's hard. But um, for every moment you get to really make a difference in someone's life, it's it's definitely worthwhile. But you have to. Medicine will always, always be able to supersede your life if you let it. Um, so you have to, you have to remember that it's a very good job and it's a very privileged job to have, but it is still a job, and you should still be a whole person at the end of the day. And lastly, what advice would you give to a pre-med student still in college or any med students that are studying? So I think that um, I think one of the biggest things. That I've seen people struggle with, and I know that you know, pre med struggle with it, medical students struggle with it, our residents struggle with it. Is this you, it's very hard to stay confident when you compete for these things all the time, right? We take exams and we get ranked by scores, and we take classes and we get ranked by our GPA, and we start to identify, we let those numbers identify who we are as people, and how we feel about our strengths and weaknesses and our ability to care for patients. Um, these things are not nothing because they do, in some cases, open doors for you, but they're not the end-all be-all. Numbers are important metrics because they are predictive of how we are going to do on board exams and how easy it's going to be for us to pass classes. And they're important things that um, schools have to look at, but they're not the end of they're not the, the end-all be-all. So I would tell anybody in any spectrum of where they're at in medicine that to, to try to not lose focus of who they are and what they believe they have to offer their patients and to allow that moment to drive them to make themselves a little better. When you feel yourself getting overwhelmed and you don't know how on earth you're going to study all this stuff for the test or you still aren't remembering something you feel like you should know, find something you can focus on and turn a wrong answer into a right answer. This is what I say to my little pre-meds getting ready for step one all the time, right? You you have a finite amount of time and stressing isn't gonna help, right? So find something, find that problem area, that thing when that question comes up, you're just like, oh my God, no, not immunology. Mm -hmm. And find that thing and dedicate some time to it. Turn a wrong answer to a right answer. And try as best as you can not to lose sight of who you are in the process because not all medical students are created equal and you and what I mean by that is that you have different strengths and weaknesses dedicated to different roles um, and finding a good 
good support system that can remind you of those things. Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. You gave some great advice. Hopefully the viewers enjoyed this. I'm sure there's lots of people that want to be pediatricians. Yeah. So thank you so much. Yeah. Taking care of kids is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But whatever whatever you're meant to do, you know, there's there are, there are babies to be born and there are surgeries to be done. And, you know, there's lots of different kinds of doctors that we need in the world. So um, being in medicine, you have to physically be willing to take care of people every day. And that's going to be challenging time to time but um, there is a there is a moment you know that when you are when you walk into the room and you have an opportunity to calm someone's fears or answer a question they may have you know with insurance reimbursement and this that and the other and hours and billing and notes and all this stuff there's something very sacred about your ability to walk into a room and to help someone and your medical education that's something that nobody can take away from you is your ability to do exactly Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Hello, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video with Dr. Anderson. Um, I hope that you learned something valuable, whether you're a pre-med student, whether you're a med student, or if you're um, interested in being a pediatrician one day. So please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I'd love to know what you guys think of this video. Thank you. Until next time.